Okay, so in the previous video I showed how if you have two completely identical forces, the force that actually keeps its units together uh, will actually win a decisive victory over an equal sized force that actually spreads its force out. Um, which is one of those remarkable things that even today on the modern battlefield one of the biggest force amplifiers is the human brain actually understanding how these things work. But of course the most obvious thing is not all tanks are the same. Um, and so what I have here is a collection of tanks from World War II. And World War II was incredible because uh, at the beginning of the war there really wasn't a good idea of how these things would work in, in battle. And by the end of World War II, which is only like, you know, five or so years later, um, tank warfare, modern mechanised armoured warfare, had emerged in essentially it, its present form, along with the fighting vehicles that you would need to do it. Um, and I'm going to start with the, the Battle of France. Um, and the, the, this was the main British battle tank of the time. It's the Matilda. Uh, and all tanks are basically a compromise of essentially three factors. There's mobility, which is how far can it go and how fast can it do it. There is how much armour you have, which basically determines how much of a pummeling the vehicle can take and still remain operable. And then thirdly, it's how much firepower you can put on it, which sort of defines the targets it can take out. Now, it actually turns out that the, the, the French had really the best tanks uh, in early, early World War II, they had the, what's it called, the Char, Char B, I think it was. Um, and the Germans really had nothing to counter it, but, you know, it was slow. And yeah, this is another thing that I mentioned in the previous video. If you can't get your, your vehicles to where they need to fight, they've effectively been defeated before they've even fired a shot. And that was the case with a lot of the the French tanks and even when they did actually get <laughs> that these um, tanks of the French were very heavily armoured uh, to the point where some of them took a, a, a lot of hits and still remained functional. So they did give the Germans a hell of a headache when they actually met them but the Germans uh, fought much better as a unit. The Germans had radios on, on all of their tanks which meant they could actually work together as a unit. So, um, this is the Matilda, uh, the British battle tank, it weighed about 25-ish tons or so. And it was very heavily armoured and not very fast. Which turned out to be not that bad in early, early World War II. In that um, the Germans at the beginning of World War II really didn't have anything that would stop it. And so it's it's fairly depressing. And one of the curiosities about this this tank is the gun would only fire um, solid shot, which is basically the penetrating the armor of other armored vehicles. So you know, the main gun couldn't fire high explosives, which is mostly used against uh, personnel and soft targets and such like. But to an extent, that really doesn't matter if you've got machine guns on this thing and the enemy have no way of stopping you. So it turns out when the Germans got all the way across to the channel and sort of cut off the British, one of the moments that gave the Germans a real scare was a counterattack by these guys um, because none of their anti-tank weapons would work. You know, they, at the time their anti-tank weapons were really, really very modest in size. Um, and it was an act of desperation that the Germans pulled out these guys, which is the most famous, um, uh, probably the most famous um, anti-tank weapon of the war, the German 88. Now originally it was designed um, to shoot down aircraft, so the, the, the gun elevates all the way up. And practically what that means is it has a very high muscle velocity. I think it fires shells about twice the speed of sound or something. And that made it a very effective anti-tank weapon. And so later on, yeah, the Germans really did start putting this in as many of their tanks as they could. 
but it was basically these things. I think they only had fired high explosives at the time that, is sent, that, that eventually stopped the Matildas um, uh, from, from breaking through or breaking out. Uh, but it rattled the Germans sufficiently much. Um, uh, yeah, it, it gave them a, a significant fright at the time. But the 88, yeah, they formed a battle line out of the 88s, and that stopped the tanks, and that was basically it. Um, yeah, the cutoff force was re reduced and, and effectively destroyed. Now, the main German battle tank at the beginning was. Uh, well, actually, actually, it was um, mostly Panzer threes and fours. This is a Panzer IV. Um, and it, it, it demonstrates a lot of the early thinking about tank design, which is basically it's a fortified box. You'll notice this also is essentially a fortified box with sort of fairly upright sides. Now, that actually turned out to... Uh, it, it was a sort of work, but turns out later on there's a very simple thing that you can do that makes it much more effective. But the other thing is the Germans had communication on their tanks, which made them significantly more effective, even against people with better tanks. And you know, the, the problem for the Germans is when they invaded Russia, which they principally again did with Panzer 3s and 4s, um, they wiped out all of the early Russian armor they came up against because that was uh, all obsolete light and medium tanks. So um, that wasn't really the problem. The real problem is when they came up against this guy, which is one of the most iconic tanks ever. In fact, you know, this was the, the tank that really got it right. And... It was a huge surprise for the Germans, who really didn't know the Russians had it. It's the T-34. Because it's fighting in Russia, and it's going to do lots of off-road stuff, it's got wide tracks, it's got large road wheels, which you might not think is important, but compared to the German tank, which has narrower tracks, these guys used to get bogged down in the mud. These guys didn't. And most importantly of all, sloped armor, which you wouldn't have thought is that important. But it turns out that um, sloping your armor like this means that uh, weight for weight, um, not only is there a chance of a deflecting shot, but also as, as you take a, a, a flat pillar and put it on its side, the actual length that a shot has to go through to penetrate the armor becomes thicker. Uh, yeah, the path it has to go through of the, of the armor becomes longer. So the armor becomes much more effective weight for weight when you slope it like this. Um, and this is the later one. This is the T-3485 with a big turret, big gun on it. The early ones had smaller turrets and smaller guns. Uh, and they were a bit cramped, didn't work quite so well, had no communications on them. But, again, you know, they had, the Germans had this huge problem that none of their anti-tank weapons would really work on it. So, you know, when they first came up against this thing, uh, it really it just drove through their lines and ran over their anti-tank guns. Um, and like that, they're just very depressing to go up against a tank if there's nothing you can do about it. And that has a significant demoralizing effect on the troops. So the Germans... Um, they, yeah, they were outclassed by the T-34, and the only thing that really saved them was they weren't handled particularly well, and they didn't have decent communication on them, whereas the German tanks did have decent communication on them, even though they were essentially outclassed in every other aspect. But that lit a fire under the Germans' arse, which, uh, yeah, I mean, this is a common feature um, of... Um, tank design throughout the war is only when you come across a tank that is clearly superior to yours in almost every way um, does it inspire you to design something better. Um, and I'll come up to these guys here which was sort of the the Germans response to the T-34. Um, but along those very similar lines um, I'm going to now skip to War in the Desert. Uh, which was in, initially that was fought between the the Matildas and German tanks of this sort of genre. 
Um, and again, the Germans played the the strategy very well. You know, going toe to toe between these guys. Um, you know, the Panzers would have the the, the upper hand, but. Uh, Rommel, being the very, very astute guy that he was, you know, where is the point in just um, e exchanging blows with your enemy when you can annihilate him for essentially very little cost? So, even though when they were outnumbered, what the Germans would tend to do is they would use their tanks um, to bring out the the British armor. They would then actually retreat where to a place where they would have a load of these guys, the 88s which could wipe out these things without too much trouble, and the concealed AT-8s basically form a tank trap, you know, which is, again, it's the Lanchester's law thing, it's the concentration of firepower. And so, and again and again, the British would sort of fall for this thing of being lured in by the retreating German tanks um, into these kill zones um, with things like the German AT-8s. However, um, you know, the Americans uh, were now... Uh, both supplying England and you know maybe going to enter the war themselves, and they came up. <laughs> I, I mean, it really is quite amazing. The, the Americans didn't have a medium tank of any sort at the beginning of World War Two, so these things were really put together on the fly. And the first thing you've really got to decide on is the engine. And in this case, the engine was an airplane engine because it was powerful, it was light, and most importantly. It was available essentially immediately, um, and the, the, the sort of design elements of this are sort of fairly similar to the Char B. You know, there's a French tank, and it had a sort of howitzer on the side here, which is actually a very nice, powerful gun. Um, but the tank obviously had shortcomings. First of all, it was riveted, which means if it gets hit, what? You know, but even by high explosives, the rivets tend to pop and they burst around inside the tank and can kill people. Um, the other thing is, of course, it has a very high profile, which um, it makes it an easy target to spot and target. And thirdly, of course, the, the 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 gun that does the real damage is actually fairly low down on the tank, which means you can't put it in a sort of hold down position, which is like essentially where you bury the tank and just have the turret poking out. Um, so that was essentially a very rapid. This was the the M3 Lee, and it was very hurriedly rushed into service, and it was replaced very soon afterwards by probably the most iconic of the American tanks, which is the M4 Sherman. And this again, um, in many aspects, it sort of got it right. In fact, in many ways, it's it's quite nice to actually just sort of see the the, the convergent design of of these sort of vehicles that yeah you know, they're all sort of converging on sloped armor and um actually they did have some somewhat different suspension but the other thing that these both shared in common is they could be mass manufactured very easily anyway so uh the the m4 sherman started showing up on the scenes in increasing numbers in africa and that really did tipped the balance in favor of the Allies, and um, that that really did contribute to the Allied victory in in Africa. Now, meanwhile, the Germans heard the problem, what the hell do we do about this guy? And uh, there, there were various things that they, they just, you know, thought about, and the, the first thing they did was basically to copy it which is this guy, this is the Panther. Um, and by the end of the war, this was probably the apex of the medium tank, uh, you know, in terms of it was fast, it was mobile, um, it had a very good gun on it, it had good armor on it, and you know, it, it was a very good all-round tank. Uh, however, um, well, there, there were political sensitivities about it looking too much like a clone. So there is actually, there were, um, how should we say, political aspects of not directly copying the T-34. Um, anyway, and of course it's got the big road wheels on it. Which... So, that was their first response to the T-34. 
The second was that whilst these guys weren't actually um, much use against you know, a toe-to-toe -to -toe fight with something like a T-34, because they really needed a bigger gun on it, but the chassis couldn't really handle bigger guns, so they came up with essentially the tank destroyer idea. And this is the Stug, which is a turned out to be a very successful fighting vehicle. The chassis is basically that of the Panzer III. This is a Panzer IV. So again, yeah, the chassis is almost identical, and all they do is they put a bigger gun on it and take the turret out. Um, and these were very good because of the low profile, heavy armor, and easy to conceal. So the Stug was a, a great success. The uh, Tiger, which is this guy, uh, was an incredibly formidable tank, very powerful 88 gun on it, very heavy armour. Problem was, of course, is twofold. First of all, they were very expensive to make, and secondly, they weighed a ton. So virtually all of these, uh, yeah, a lot of these vehicles here, they clock in about 30 or so tons. This thing weighed uh, 50, 60 tons, that sort of thing. Uh, which meant that it's an absolute pain in the ass to transport these things. It means that you need more solid ground to actually move on. Uh, so, uh, yeah, w when it was in the right arena, the Tiger was a very formidable weapon, but in other places it was an absolute nightmare. You know, if one of these things broke down, uh, trying to recover it from the battlefield was a nightmare because you needed basically something that can tow a 60 ton tank um, off road and you know, the, the, the bare minimum they reckoned to do that was a two other Tigers or a, or a tank recovery vehicle all fairly unsatisfactory um, so that was the problems with the, the Tiger and then this guy was the the, the elephant, uh, which is essentially a very large tank destroyer. And this thing was really a, a big failure in that they were very expensive to build, very heavy. So they suffer all the same problems as the Tiger. Of course, it doesn't have a very high traverse on its, its gun. And what really killed it when it was first used is it didn't actually have a machine gun. This is a later variant that actually a machine gun on but it doesn't have a machine gun on for close support. If you take a look at all these other tanks, they've usually got at least two machine guns on. There's one is coaxial with main gun, and so they all have a sort of coaxial machine gun on, on the main gun, and they have a hull machine gun on the front. The early versions of this didn't have a machine gun on, so basically, once it got separated for the infantry, it was just an absolute sitting duck, and what the Russians would do is they just crawl, you know, climb on top of it, pour petrol in wherever they could, and essentially torch the crew. And also, it was really too heavy for the engine and all sorts of other problems. So, it, the, the 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 Elephant was, uh, yeah, really a, a failure. So, by this time, you can see the Germans have sort of converged on big, heavy guns that could, yeah, they're very good. Um, in wide open terrain, um, but you, these tanks cost more to make than the Russians, and the Russians were churning them out faster than the Germans were, and the Americans were doing the same. And also, the, the ability to sort of standardize your fighting force actually helps a huge amount, such that if all of your fighting vehicles are T-34s, the supply system for the repairs becomes much easier, as does the um, munitions and such like. With all these things, yeah, with a lot of them, they all had different munitions for them. They all had different repair um, regimes and such like. But, so in the Battle of Kursk, you basically had the first appearance of the Panther, the Elephant. Those were mostly failures in their first um, battle because both were thoroughly unreliable. Uh, the Panther, they eventually sorted out all of the reliability problems, and it really did become a forbid formidable tank. However, um, the Americans, in the meantime, had basically settled on this thing, which is their 
equivalent of the T-34 and they decided that, you know, because this had been such a success in Africa that they really didn't need another tank because, you know, this 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 had done very well in, in uh, Africa and they weren't really expecting Normandy to come up against anything much bigger than this. Now, of course, um, you know, complacency is a killer in warfare and what they actually found in Normandy was significant numbers of tigers and panthers uh, which really did absolutely uh, make a mess of the Shermans to the point where they call them uh, Ronsons because of the 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 cigarette lighter on the on the rather uh, I guess dark war humor that when it hit when when you strike it it always lights up on you know because when you actually hit them they would always catch fire or Tommy cookers now the only thing that the Allies did to sort of really um, sort of restore the balance was basically upgun the tank. Um, and this was, they put a British, I think it was a 17 pounder um, gun on it, which was really too big a gun for the tank. But, uh, you know, these things had to get insanely close to the German tanks to have a sensible chance of knocking them out. Whereas this guy could essentially, yeah, it, it, was, it wasn't an even fight, but... Um, it had a much better chance of knocking out the German tanks. Um, of course, by this time, the Allies had essentially complete air superiority, uh, which uh, really um, was a game-changer in that to actually have fighting vehicles like this to be really effective, you need lots of them close together. You know, that's the concentration of firepower thing. You need them well supplied um, and well maintained. And all, for all of those things, you need a supply infrastructure. And airplanes really disrupt all of this. They stop you. If, you. if you put all of your tanks together, then it makes it much easier for the enemy to destroy them in an air attack. It makes it much harder to um, supply and maintain them and, and all that sort of thing. So, anyway, that's basically the the tank evolution of, of World War II. And the, the, the medium tank that they all essentially converged on for, you know, because they, they have the compromise of speed, mobility, and firepower were, were these three, which is the T-34 for the Russians, the Sherman for the Allies and the Panther for the Germans.